Flesh Love, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's a real pleasure. I have to be honest with you. I've followed your career for years now. Um, I think I started listening to you back when I was living in Montreal. So, uh, and at the time you were with uh, Kari Bastani, which was a, a, a group out in Europe. Uh, but I wanted to tell you before I even started this interview is that it was a difficult uh, planning session at my end because I, I was like, oh, I'm interviewing Flesh Love. This is an artist I really admire. How do I want to conduct this interview? And the first thing I could say was, I just wanted to have an artist to artist talk with you. Mm -hmm. It sounds amazing to me. Yeah. Um, so let's, um, for people who don't know you, let's give just a little bit of bi biographical information here. Uh, I know that you were born in Switzerland. Now you live in Paris. Can mm -hmm. you give us a little overview of, you know, how, how did you discover that, for example, you could sing or that you wanted to be an artist? So that's a very interesting question because it brings a lot of like, when I was younger, I always used to sing, but my parents, my family actually thought that I was singing terrible. So it's very interesting, you know, because I, I don't know, deep down, I felt like singing was, was something important to me, vital in a way, but I was not encouraged by my family or the people around me. So. But at a very young age, I was, I don't know, like four or five. So I kept on singing, even if I, I didn't feel that um, support. So I kind of had to create my own support to be my own best supporter, which is something that really helped me, you know, like and it's still helping me. So how did I that help you. How, how did that help you? You know, when your parents don't believe in you. <laughs> If people outside of your family, if the society like doesn't believe in you, it doesn't really matter that much. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. so you kind of feel, okay. So it's not that my parents, like they, my father was an economist and my mother was an economist as well, you know, so for them singing was not really a job, you know, mm -hmm. and, and to be very honest, when I was young, like I didn't sing that well. <laughs> and you know, when like, I, I, I started really becoming a singer and earning my life as a singer when I was around 25 and when I say to my parents I want to like I want to stop going to the university and starting being a singer they were like okay you can do as you want you know like so at that very moment they started supporting me when I decided to be really a singer but that was a long process from from four years old to 25 it's a long process yeah and so at what point did you move to Paris? I decided because I had like the first part of my career, I was in a band and it was a very complicated experience for me. I was a young girl. I was 19 when I started surrounded by guys. And uh, when I finished this part of my career, I decided to move on and to move to another place where I could start all over again, like fresh start. And I decided to go to Paris. It's not far away from Geneva, actually, three hour and a half by train. They do speak French. And I kind of knew some people over there in the industry. So I was like, okay, I could start fresh, but I could still not be alone. And it's a big, it's a big city to me, you know, coming from Geneva, Paris is intimidating in a way. Has Paris been uh, very welcoming to your work? Actually, yes. And you know what? Maybe to my personality as well. Because um, Switzerland, it's like, it's a very interesting country. Because from the outside, for a lot of people, it seems like it's a kind of paradise. It is in a way, you know, economically, politically, like. But it's a bit complicated because of the history of Switzerland and the history of Geneva, because we had Calvin. We had Luther, you know, we had le, le protestantisme. Protest, I don't know how you say that in English, but protestantisme. Uh, Protestantism. I, I, I don't know well, either, actually. <laughs> so it, this whole thing kind of shaped the energy of the city. And we still have that vibe now. And it infused a way of living where you, like being loud is not very allowed. 
It's allowed, but it's not recommended. Earning a lot of money, but being anonymous. And as a woman, being raised in Switzerland was a bit complicated. Switzerland had, you know, like the last woman who were burnt as a witch, it was in Switzerland, you know, like mm. women's, the, the, the rights to vote. It was 1974, I think, in Switzerland. So we have a kind of story with women, which is a bit complicated. So I felt like I had to go out of this place in order to find myself or maybe to feel more accepted. And in Paris, it's a different vibe. And I didn't feel that I was too much for once in my life. I felt like I was, I'm, I'm normal. <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting because I live in Ottawa, uh, Ontario, Canada, which is it's the capital of Canada. It is very much the Switzerland of Canada. And really? living in Montreal, oh yeah, very much so. And uh, Montreal is like the Berlin of Canada. It is the Paris mm. of Canada. Montreal is where you can be the eccentric. And so it's beautiful to hear that you found really your your home in Paris in a way. Would you refer to it as your home now? I feel like, and that's something I'm starting to understand, that my home is myself. Because I could be moving around and still feeling like home, you know? I'm trying to build that feeling within myself. You know what I mean? Like deep down feeling, like I love Paris. I spent, like I've been there for about four years, but I feel like that maybe in one year, I would I move to somewhere else, yeah. Like I'm still, figuring out where I want to go. But this energy, this vibrant energy of Paris, I still, I don't feel now that it's connecting with what I'm looking for right now. Not anymore. Okay. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. I guess Paris is a good place for, like you said, like you, you get away from a place like Switzerland or a place that's maybe more conservative or more yes. um, quiet. And it's where you, and also you have access to all sorts of creative people. Did you uh, end up meeting and, and really working with uh, some good creative talent in Paris? Re yeah. And you know, with Instagram and like, it's incredible. Like you can follow people you really admire and then like you, you try to write them and they answer and then you meet them and things happen. So it's very exciting. That's a very exciting part of Paris. So I, I'm sure London or Montreal or New York. That's very great. Yeah, yeah, I met a lot of people actually in Paris. Right. Um, so like I said earlier, is that I was really introduced to your work through Kadi Bastani. Uh, Castle in the Snow was a song that I listened to on repeat over and over again. I did a lot of my photographic work in Montreal listening to that that song actually. Wow. Yeah, so it's very inspiring. Uh, do you still are you do you still have the rights to that song? Can you still perform it, um, or is it a song that you would prefer to just forget right now? So um, it's very interesting because I was very depressed when I wrote that song. And what is very beautiful with music is that you, as a writer, you have a connection to that song, a feeling, but then you kind of offer that music to the world, and everyone then relates to this song very differently, you know? So mm -hmm. I wrote that song because I needed to express something that was very like hidden. And what is very interesting with my music is most of the time when I wrote the song, I don't understand what it means. What the song is trying to tell me, kind of, um, it's kind of the unconscious inside of me was trying to be more visible and then conscious through the song. So. For example, with this song, I kind of understood what I was going through two years after writing that song. <laughs> wow. But it happens to me a lot. So I don't really listen to that song anymore because it kind of makes me sometimes sad. Mm -hmm. But it's like I Umusunai wrote a song for, for Flesh Love and I understood that song. So actually, someone made me understand that song two years after. It was like, oh, you know, like this is very shamanic and this is. I was like, okay, I never thought about this because I never think when I write. So that's very interesting. I like that. <laughs> yeah, that is very, and you know what? Again, uh, speaking to you as an artist myself, it's the first time I hear another artist say that they didn't know what they were writing when they were creating it. I felt the same, I feel the same way when I do my paintings, um, which is that I never know why I'm doing it until it's done. And sometimes it, 
shows up years later. So yeah. is this um, something that is it still this the the same concept now when you create you still kind of just let I guess the muse kind of create it for you kind of thing or do you now know like ahead of time that you have something to say I don't know who wrote that and I find it very beautiful and soothing and healing in a way he said that when you create you are outside of yourself because l'extase extase extases I don't know how you say that in English the Latin like it means being outside of yourself. And when you create, you are in a trance, kind of, you are outside of yourself. And if you are inside of yourself, you don't let the light, because it was kind of, it was a believer that it was something, that creation is something bigger than you. And you just have the chance, like you kind of chosen in a way, but everyone could be chosen, but in order to welcome, the beauty of the creation you got to be outside of yourself so it's 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 very interesting because it's we're not used to see that because in creation a lot of time we mix that up with ego and in this perspective i'm not the creator i am well i'm wel welcoming the creation and i find it very interesting because once you release the song there's no ego because it's not your song <laughs> It's it's a hard thing to very to understand, and I'm trying to, but I find it very interesting. That is very very fascinating for sure. Is has there ever ever been a song that you've released where you just didn't like it afterwards? You know what is more than not liking it, not very like not really understanding the lyrics or even like the music I created. I was like, I'm not sure if I was really aware during the whole process i would have done that kind of music <laughs> it's more about that you know like that is kind of weird but so that, like i'm trying to i'm not trying to be versatile i'm just trying to welcome and most of the time the things that i welcome i'm, I'm not sure is the thing that i like the most in the music <laughs> ah <laughs> weird so saying the... that <laughs> No, it, it makes, I, I can see how it makes sense, uh, especially as if, as your, do you find that you're at a stage right now? So right now you're, you're, you pretty much have a solo career, you're called Flesh Love. You've, um, you know, really kind of created your own new identity. Do you find that, is it um, an identity that is always evolving and therefore that's why you're kind of more uh, relaxed in how you uh, create your music? Yeah, and I think, I feel as well that it's very connected to my spiritual path. And I'm kind of, I'm learning now, you know, about this whole identity things. Like I used to think that I was a certain way and that I should stay that way. And I am like dis destroying this whole, this whole idea. And I am accepting that I'm always moving. It's like physic quantique, you know, like, I don't know how you say that in English, but quantique, physique, you know, like it's, it's something we are all made of energy. We're moving. We're made of the, the, the powders of the stars, you know, that, that's really like the dust. And so this whole musical process, I don't know where it would lead me in, in, in two months, actually. And maybe I, I, I will not be longer a musician and it could be, it would be okay as well. Like, I don't know. What would you, is there anything you, you've been wanting to try? I would love like uh, to work. I'm very interested about ethnobotanic. I'm very interested about biomimetism a lot. And I would love to work, like I don't know if it's a job actually, maybe I should create that, but trying to find link between like how animals um, uh, behave and what we could learn from their behaviors as well. T kind of psycho, biomimetism or something like that. I don't know, I, I would find that fascinating. It's uh, interesting because one of my guests is an expert on biomimicry. So really? she studies, yes, yes. Oh, so I can ask wow. her that question if you'd like, but she does, yeah, uh, yeah so she um, studies engineering on, you know, based on how nature works. So, wow. um, it's beautiful to hear that as an artist yourself, you're, you're inspired. Is nature one of your big inspirations? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Actually, I, 
it's even sometimes in my lyrics, I put some uh, references. Like, for example, in one of my songs called Festa Tocandira, the rap part, I said, Di Crocolion d'Andriticum. And it's, it's, it's a parasite, you know, like I was very fascinated by that. And I read books about that. And I was like, I should put that in the song. <laughs> That's so cool. <laughs> so I'm trying to add, um, like, biologic references about biology, uh, about animals, about astronomy. You know, like I'm trying because I find it interesting and I'm like, maybe some people would be interested too. <laughs> yeah, well, and not just that, but you've made it completely relatable. Uh, I, I actually want to talk about Festa Tocandira uh, because it is a song that when I first heard it, uh, I hated you for it because it was so beautiful <laughs> you oh, know when you kind of no not a hate hate but you know when you hate somebody because you're like oh this is so powerful and it literally I, I cried the first time I heard it because it was so wow. intense it came from the gut from from the innards of a person you know um yeah. but also there's an inspiration there uh and it's actually something I was already familiar with that I saw on a documentary these men who go through a ritual with ants uh can you tell me a little bit about that Actually, I studied, before starting as a musician, I studied, but I didn't finish, I studied ethnology and science of religions. So I was very interested about other cultures. And um, myself, I am a, I'm, I'm from a, a, a tribe, from a, an Algerian tribe called Amazigh. So I was very interested about that. And I, I don't know when actually and how, but I, I find a documentary, I think as well, as well, about that Festa Tocandira, a ritual. And, you know, like men has to prove that they are very maleish and, and they have to go through that very painful process, you know, of putting their hands on gloves filled with ants, but like not regular ants that you can find in Paris, but that you can <laughs> find in Brazil, like Brazil. And I don't know, I was watching that documentary and I was like, what if you don't want to go through all that process? What if as a man, you, you, you don't, you don't want to prove anything because you have actually to do that ritual like nearly over 20, 20 times, you know, which is like crazy because wow. like your hands start like swallowing and you don't, you, you're not allowed to cry or to see, or to, oh, sorry, or to show that you suffer, which is crazy. So you have to go through all that pain and you have to kind of prove to other pe to to the people in your community that you are a real man because you don't feel anything and i was kind of i don't know i was wondering like what if you want to cry and what if crying is not what if crying would be considered as something powerful as well you know like what if vulnerability could be considered as well something beautiful and so that's why i started writing that song you know and I, I wrote that song in Spanish because I felt like it was, you know, I don't know. I felt like it was, it would be better, more suitable to sing it in Spanish. And it's, I don't know, it's still a song. A lot of people talk about that. And a lot of guys actually write me about this song, which I find beautiful because there is a moment when I am like in a trance. So I kind of understand that you felt that this song was very like intense. Yes. <laughs> And I'm like, boys cry too. Like, you know, I'm like, I want it because I'm not an advocate, but I talk a lot about feminist things. And I kind of wanted to show that I was with them as well in a way. Like, I'm not going to do their work, you know, like they kind of, they, they have to do it for themselves. But that I know that it's not only great things to be an alpha male, you know, and I read a lot of uh, the books about, um, from Bell Hooks about male, what's the name of it? I don't remember this incredible book she wrote about being a male and, and not having access to all the emotions and being just allowed to be angry. And she was like, I don't want to be equal to men. I want to have access to all my emotions and, and I want men to have access to all the emotions as well. So I don't know, it was interesting to me. It was a process where I was like, it's very empathic in a way because I'm writing if I were a man from from that kind of, from that tribe, actually. Okay, so that perspective, I, I totally understand the song even more now. 
Uh, and what's also interesting, though, is is uh, is how you perform it uh, in the music videos I've seen and and the performances I've seen in France. Um, did it take a while for you to to have the kind of confidence to actually let go to 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 move the way you move to present yourself the way you present yourself? Did it take a while to build that throughout your career? That's a good question, actually, because I always thought that when I was on stage. I was not myself anymore, but what was harder to me was building the confidence before and after being on stage. And with like before being on stage, it means like feeling like I am allowed to be on stage, I'm good enough. And after going back to that kind of different vibes because I'm in a trance, meeting other people and facing their uh, critics towards my music as well you know because sometimes people after a show they feel like it's the greatest moment to tell you how much they don't like your music oh man <laughs> <laughs> so th this is it's more about before and after the show but while i'm on stage like if it's for a tv show actually it's complicated because you have three minutes and actually for me my whole show is created like a it's a kind of theater experience immersive so it takes a while and it's and it's built and it's organic in a way. So I give time for the people and for myself to really go and dive deep into the experience. Sometimes for me, if it's a TV show or radio show, three minutes is not enough. <laughs> no, at all. <laughs> this is why I like these long, longer formats is because we get to actually talk about stuff that you don't get to talk in a three minute interview. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, they will ask you, like, why why have you chosen that name and why are you a musician? And actually, it would take more than three minutes to say it. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so it's interesting that you say it's before and after. One of the conversations that comes up a lot with my friends who, you know, have had great success, whether they're working on movie sets or with Cirque du Soleil, it's that they get this um, this moment of sadness when they leave a project, uh, you know, when they finish filming, for example, with the same team for three months. Do you, uh, if you haven't performed in a while, for example, during the pandemic, do you find, uh, do you get a sense of uh, mourning? Mm. Not really, because I think I'm in a phase where I was kind of, I'm kind of tired of touring because to me, it's such an overwhelming experience. Like, for example, sitting eight hours in a car being drained and then you have to perform in front of people and you give your heart because that's how you do it, you know? And then you have this high, like rush of adrenaline and then you go back to your kind of uh, ugly hotel room and you are alone once again so this whole process is very draining to me and i've been doing that for 10 years so i would say that for me i'm not mourning i'm not missing that much touring because i'm in a phase where i'm more into um creating video clips directing video clips for me it's it's my phase now so <laughs> it takes me a lot of time and i enjoy that for the moment that's you know that's my thing i i have a lot of how do you say that like i'm interested in about a lot of different things that's that's the problem in my life so i can get bored very easily right and but do you miss the contact with the public as much as you get you know you get the really crappy feedback like the guys who are like oh i didn't like this um but you also get a lot of um praise right i mean there you've got to have like this, these fans who love your work um do you miss the contact with them or do you really find like you know what this is better video is better for me because i can just do it at my pace and you know let in some contact and and not have to deal with the rest um I miss that. The great thing is that I have a Patreon and I'm like, when you write me on Instagram, I answer. So some people who, um, who love my music, they kind of, they became my friends. So that's, that's very nice. And, uh, I don't like calling them my fans because I find it very weird. It's kind of homogenic. I don't know. Like they're not human beings anymore. They're kind of a tribe. Ah, <laughs> uh, you know? yeah with one big head and, and two big <laughs> arms. And, I don't know, like, because those people have jobs as well, you know, like 
you know, sometimes you can feel that because you're an artist, you you superior than anyone else. So I'd rather call them by their names. So that's something I do a lot. But what I miss is the energy when you are on stage and you feel that people connect to your music. It's it's beautiful because the the audience and you you kind of forming a huge energy together and it changes every single night, you know? So that's very interesting. And and as a as a lover of ethnology, I can as well understand a lot of things um, when I meet people and how they relate to music and how they consume music in a show. If I go to Korea, if I go to Montreal, if I go to Zurich, people, they listen very differently. And, you know, when, you're, when they are in a show, and I find it very interesting. <laughs> That's a fascinating, you know what, I'd never even thought about that. So what what are some things that you found remarkable between, like, in terms of differences between how people appreciate music, depending on the various countries? For example, when I was in Korea, I played in Seoul, actually, last year. And I've never been to Korea before. So that was, that was my, my first experience. So I remember going on stage and started singing and people were yelling. So my first thought was like, oh my gosh, they hate my music because normally in Europe, you don't yell during the, 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 the song, you know? Right. So I started dancing, they were yelling and at the end they were like yelling and they were like, they were clapping so loud. And I understood that that was their way of showing me appreciation. <laughs> but oh, it wow. took me five minutes to understand that it was not like they did not like my music. <laughs> And, it, and once I understood that, it was one of the most interesting experience I ever had because it was 60 minutes of people yelling, clapping, dancing. And at the end, I, I don't know, like maybe 200 people came to see me and they and to tell me how much they liked what I've just like what I did for them, which is crazy. So that's it amazing. Was, yeah, it was so great. <laughs> it was so great. And for example, you go to you play in Zurich, and people would be like, they would be silent, and at the end of the song they would be clapping. But you know there is a kind of a way of containing yourself. But it doesn't mean they don't like your music. It means they're really listening. You know, you can't hear a sound during a song. You know, they're really listening to what you're doing, and yeah. They're kind of shy, but it's beautiful in a way. So you start to understand a bit more about how people like lead the culture as well while you are touring. Very, very interesting. Is there a way to, I don't know if, I mean, you said that you're concentrating more on video. Do you get any kind of international feedback when you're when, with video though? What do you mean by international feedback? Like, well, the, the, in the same way that uh, like you're performing, like you said, you noticed in Korea, they react a different way. With video, it's a little bit harder, right, to tell how yeah. people react. Uh, so is there a way that you can think of that you could kind of experience the different feedback? Um, but, um, when people sometimes write me on Instagram to share with me how they, how they feel about a video or um, through the comments as well, maybe. But it's not the same. It's not direct. Right. Um, okay. Yeah. It's, so yeah, let's, it's um, So what I was really curious about is that you've been working a lot with a photographer by the name of Roberto Greco. Yeah. Uh, how did that relationship come about? And what's been the experience like, you know, working with a photographer? Actually, Roberto is one of my, um, is, is one of my sister best friend my big sister. So I've been knowing him for about uh, nearly 15 years or even a bit more. And when I was 15, I remember I started a blog in Geneva because I was like, oh, there's nothing happening in the city. So I have to, uh, I have to create something. And I, I remember it was about fashion and what you could uh, experience in Geneva. And he was already a photographer, actually. He was a student. And I asked him if he could uh, organize a photo, sh a photo shoot for me and we did that together and I remember he told me I really want to be the photographer of your uh, first album but I was 15 so you know I do believe in synchronicity I do believe in uh, 
when you put intention, you know, when you send intention to the universe. And I was like, okay, okay. <laughs> but I didn't even know at that time if I, were to, if I would be a singer or, you know. But I, I, I kind of feel that he knew it before me. And so that's how. And when I moved to Paris, he was in Paris. So it was kind of natural. And he's a very, very talented, like, artist, actually. He's very yeah. picky and he takes a lot of time <laughs> to to control everything, actually. You know, he is a perfectionist. Yeah, we see that a lot, actually. A lot of uh, musicians now are working with uh, with photographers. I think it was, um, I, and I probably will mispronounce this, but uh, D'Antward, who worked yeah. with a black and white photographer for their first, um, like their most popular music videos. And now you're you're working with a, um, a photographer for your music videos. Is that a, um, a partnership where you both have the creative control or is he more like in charge of the, the, the creative look and, and stuff like that? Uh, with Roberto, it was half half. Like most of the time, I used to come up with an idea, and then we started building from that point. And it was a collaboration. Um, we used to write the video clips together, and he and he directed them. Then I started working working with Juan Delo for Aquerontia uh, because I wanted to be more involved because I kind of I kind of know what I want, so I started co-directing and then on my last video clip I decided to direct I was like I'm not perfect like I know I make a lot of mistakes but I want to I, I love to learn through mistakes which is very interesting because for example Roberto is the kind of person who will like it will come up with something and show it to the world only when it's perfect and I'm the I'm exactly the opposite you know I'm I'm, I'm learning pr produce like producing music uh while releasing my music <laughs> and it's the same with video clips you know i'm learning through the whole process i'm a learner actually do you do you enjoy it yeah you know it's kind of a way to connect to my inner child you know like it's for me it's playing it's creating music is playing uh directing videos i love to do mood boards like i do crazy mood boards with a lot of um with a lot of pictures with like every seconds of the video clip i write i don't know how you say that like i cut every seconds you know in order to to give intention to call them um, i don't know how you say like I'm a sure storyboard what what do you say a storyboard yeah exactly thank you okay a very precise storyboard and and because I find it exciting because when I create music I see uh I, I see everything actually I see, it's kind of a movie it's sound and image okay very very interesting uh you mentioned uh the other day or it might actually have been today I saw a post that you made on social media about the tiny houses yeah. <laughs> can we talk about that yeah, I feel like you said it too. <laughs> yeah, well, it's you know, it's it's funny because I'm actually you know I moved back to Ottawa from Montreal because I just I kind of had a creative block. I needed to move. Mm. I don't like living in in the capital city. I want to move out to nature. Uh, yeah. So it's something that also it very much interests me. Uh, why the tiny house and where would you go? Well, so <laughs> I used to buy a lot of things actually, and I kind of understood that I bought things in order to feel safer. I thought that the more I have, the fuller I'll feel, safer I'll be. And through this whole spiritual path, and I know this spiritual path will take me a lifetime and it's beautiful. That's that's the, the path, which is beautiful, not the destination. I kind of started decluttering things, you know, like wanting less things, like buying less beautiful things, for example, made from, from Paris, you know, made in Paris and sustainable things and everything. And I was like, my gosh, I'm spending so much money on a flat, which is not mine. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm giving money away in a, in a city surrounded by blocks, you know, by buildings. I was like, I'd love to live in a tiny house and to travel around and to be near it, you know, to nature, because I come from Switzerland, you know, so you're surrounded by nature. Even if, if you are in a city, you're surrounded by nature. It's not like big cities like Paris or, and I don't know, I started watching 
things I think on YouTube about tiny houses. And I was kind of obsessed by this. I was like, my gosh, that could be the future. But in Switzerland, you're not allowed to, actually. So I, I don't know where I'd, I'd go. I want to go everywhere with my tiny house. <laughs> well, and it's an interesting uh, idea because it's it's not it doesn't stray from the usual process. Um, the famous film director, uh, one of my favorite film directors, uh, Sally Potter, uh, mm -hmm. Between films, she would um, isolate herself in the country in France in a small camper. Um, Bjork has been known for isolating herself in between projects uh, yes. in nature. Yes. So this is a very interesting way to feed the creative juices, isn't it? Definitely. Yeah, because you give a lot. So you have to find a way, you know, to heal yourself. So that is what could be complicated with the things of creating an album and then touring. Because you created that album, you kind of dried out, you know what I mean? And then you have to give everything back again, you know, to kind of try to recreate the magical things you had in the studio, the emotions, you know? And so that's why, you know, I really love to change the way we see the life of an artist. So I'm trying, and this, this whole period is very interesting for that because a lot of people are like, yeah, yeah, it's a great idea. But I'm trying to find a way to change the rules. For example, when you tour, most of the time, the only thing you see is the airport and the venue. So you don't see anything. It was like, my gosh, I'm, 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 in, I'm in Korea and I'm going to spend two days, you know? So now I started to change the whole thing. And I was like, okay, I want to tour less. But when I tour, I want to spend more time. And I want to meet people and artists from this place and try to create something with them. Yeah, uh, the Quebec singer Jean Leloup, he went to an Aboriginal village in the middle of nowhere in Australia, and I think he spent several months there, wow. um, you know, learning from the, the, the villagers, the people, the artists there, the local craftspeople. Um, there are, you know, there's, there's this um, methodology that is out there, but I think we just don't know about it. And when you're, yeah. you know, a young artist, you don't know that there's the possibility of playing by different rules. Definitely. And it's actually the way our brain works, you know, it's by analogy, you know, like you kind of, so that's why it's very interesting about creating your own path because you have to think differently. You have to allow, you have to understand that you can't imagine the unknown because we kind of always relate to what we know. So that is very interesting to me right now because I want to create my own path. But in order to do that, I have to understand and I'm not able to imagine my own path <laughs> because it's greater than what I could imagine because if I imagine I would relate to what other people have already done <laughs> right and do you have do, do you have a pull or like a push pull relationship with the music industry where in order to make a certain uh, living let's say you need to do it a certain way and then you have commercialism and do you find as an artist who was in a way, with Cadi Bastani, you were part of the commercial system in Europe. Yeah. Um, so now you're sitting outside of that. Do you find, is there a, a push-pull concept where you're kind of fighting against it? Or have you just abandoned the concept complete, completely? I'm trying to abandon, abandon it. I, I, actually, I created my own label. And I'm trying to understand, you know, like, do you know Amanda Palmer? Like, she's yes. a singer. Yeah. Yes. And I read a book about the art of asking and I, I saw her TED Talks and I was really inspired by how she built a community. And that's why I'm learning through my Patreon and as well, like, I know my music, most of my music, it's not going to be uh, on, a, on a radio shows, on the popular radio shows in France or in Switzerland. And it's okay because you can make a living without them. You know, when you start an industry, they make you believe that you need, you need them, you need the, the popular magazine, newspaper, but you actually don't really need them. You need a community. And that's why I'm trying to build. I relate more to people than the industry. You don't need them. You need a community. I think that's one of the most refreshing things a, a, a young artist could ever hear. Is that the advice that you would give a, a young artist these days? Yeah, actually, yeah, and to, like, to really 
listen to your intuition and your guts because you know sometimes when you sign to a label they would force you actually but to do a certain kind of music because they'd be, they'd be like oh you know that's very trendy so if you if you create this kind of music you will be successful and then the music is relay released and you you feel like it's not really connected to who you are and if it's not successful and the label label doesn't want to work with you anymore you kind of feel resentful you know and so the the advice I, I would give is that like really do the music that that really inspires you. There are a lot of artists who, who like create that way. Diamond Dagalas, Nick Cave, like a lot of people are just doing they thing, their things, and that's why they are who they are now because they are unique. Right. Yeah. It's uh, it's it's tough, right? Because a, a young a young person coming up today. I mean, the good thing is they have access to technology. They have access, yeah. like you said, you can create your own Patreon. Um, and when did you create your Patreon? I, was, I think it was in May. I started okay. in May. Yeah. It, but and it's how, more about, around astrology than music. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, actually, is that I'm really interested about astrology. And I kind of use that as a as a spiritual path as well, in order to know myself a bit more and to as well um, understand more of the people around me and and yeah to be more of a support as well and uh so that's that's why i was like because i started kind of sharing that on instagram you know like post and people were like oh we can you give lessons and i was like no i never thought about that and then i, I was like hey it could be a great idea so i was like let's learn together so i started kind of creating that patreon around the idea of giving astrology lessons and now we are like 51 which is good which is great actually <laughs> Yeah, it's 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 great because you're sharing a learning process about something with other people and that's how you build communities, right? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and that's you know that's what really like what is very interesting is I share a lot as well on my on my networks, social networks that I'm not perfect, that I doubt a lot and everything and I feel as well that my vulnerability allows as well people to connect with me, you know, like and so it's very refreshing to have this possibility not to create, you know, that kind of perfect alter ego, you know, like superstar thing, because I'm doubting a lot. And it's refreshing to have the opportunity to share it with the people who love what you do. Yeah, it gives them uh, a way to connect to you. And yeah. that, that's that's for people who are not artists, but also for people who are, you know, on the same path as you who might be photographers or theater directors or whatever I find there's a beautiful way that if if um someone who's successful is human it it gives them a chance to realize that they can retain and remain uh, human throughout the process too many people go into the star system and become hard and and kind of um they they look down upon other people right after a certain amount of success and I think it's even harder for women because you know, like in order to be successful, you have to be better than men, you know? So when you're on the top, you're kind of scared of everyone else, you know, like during the whole process where you've been through, we can't imagine, you know, what very successful women have been through. So yeah. Can you, do you want to talk a little bit about that? What was your experience as a woman in, in, in the business? Actually, I'm not super successful. What I can say is that I faced a lot of sexism in different ways because it's beautiful to have different ways of experiencing something. <laughs> <laughs> is that, for example, you know, like diminishing the amount of work I put in something. For example, I used to um, write and be a top liner for Kedabustani, but most of the time, even the journalists, they didn't like even consider the possibility that I could write something you know so it would always be like question about music would be, always be to guillaume for example or now that i am a producer people are always wondering who produces my music uh who directs my music there is always that bias about women creating but you know what is crazy i have the same bias you know sometimes when i read that a woman did everything by herself i'm like how is it possible you know because i've been raised and taught that as women, we need other people. 
I mean, needing other people is beautiful. It, it's, it's called collaboration. But it's not the same, you know, that being dismissed every time or being, uh, I was more, you know, like you are the beautiful singer or you only the singer because singer, it doesn't seem to be a real job anyway. But, you know, like my looks were always, you know, put on the table at a, at a certain moment. But now that I'm very tattooed and that I have my own kind of weird identity, it allowed me to kind of escape all this kind of beautiful thing about being a woman on stage, you know, like being beautiful on stage. I'm kind of more of a creature, which is kind of cool. <laughs> ha, that's a very fascinating way of looking at it, for sure. Your name, Flesh Love, it's, uh, it reminds me a lot of, uh, of karate, where uh, the, so the the name is uh, <laughs> well, I, I don't know if you're familiar with um, Goju Ryu Karate, where it the name no. is essentially hard soft. That's what it means. It means hard soft. It's a practice that is, you know, very stern but also very soft. And so when I see your name, I think hard soft um, flesh, which is an arrow for people who are uh, anglophone. Uh, love. Uh, so how did you decide this name, and what does it mean to you? That's very interesting, the thing you told me about karate. I kind of like <laughs> it. You know why? Because when I was 12, I was a, um, a penchak silat, which is kung fu from Malaysia. I was a, a champion. I used oh, to be... Amazing. Yeah, yeah. Like, I don't know, it gave me a lot of self-confidence because when I was a little girl, I was very scared of going outside because once someone tried to kidnap me. <laughs> And I didn't wow. want to go back in the streets. And my mother was like, okay, so we we have to find a way for you to gain self-confidence. So I started Kung Fu. That's, and I had no idea. So that's, that's very nice. I really like what you said. It's, it's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was pure luck because I had no idea that you did Kung Fu. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so that's, and that's what it made me think of immediately is, is the concept of hard soft. Because your name has a little bit of, of hardness and a little bit of softness. Is that was that on purpose? No, but it's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> I like when people make me discover things about myself. I like it. We are all connected. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, then I have to ask you: Do you have a um, kind of a masculine side and a feminine side to you as a person? Definitely, and I hope everyone has. Right. I hope everyone has in a way, you know, in the yin yang way, in the two energies, you know, that the 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 thick and the thin, the warm and the cold, you know, like but what is interesting is I believe we don't have fifty fifty person, you know, like I'm not in a perfect equilibrium. Mm -hmm. But actually I do feel more masculine. I'm actually an Aries, I'm a um, rising Leo, and I'm a moon in Gemini. So most of my astrological uh, chart is about masculine energy which is interesting <laughs> it is it is it definitely is and it really i find at least as someone who's tracked your career uh since kadi pastani and now into flesh love i find the visual process of you whether you're singing or performing it has definitely gotten more masculine more mm, kind of assertive um, I don't know. I don't even know if you realize it, but as as a viewer, I can yeah, say yeah. I've definitely seen it. But that's interesting. I I mean, I love to hear as you feel and as you see that because I don't see myself hopefully. <laughs> oh, interesting. How do you see? How do you see yourself? I don't actually. You know, that's crazy because sometimes people tell me that when I perform, I am in a trance, and I don't see myself at all. Like okay. I, I do like. I used to suffer from dysmorphia. So I used to see me in a very different way than most of the people used to see me. So I kind of still have that. And sometimes the, the experience of being on stage kind of doesn't help me with that, you know? Right. Because people see you like something not human anymore. And I don't know how I see myself. Like sometimes I see myself very uh, shy. I can be very shy. But on stage, it kind of allows me to show more that, that, that masculine side that as a woman, you know, very uh, encouraged to show. Mm -hmm. Actually, that's how I feel. Yeah. What's something that you're like really just super excited about, let's say in the next year? You know what I'm excited about is I'm mixed. What is interesting is that you 
asking me what I'm excited about the next year. I'm excited about being grateful about all the past years. Ah. That's what I'm excited. Because you know, sometimes I don't know if you feel that as an as an artist. Sometimes you always like scheduling things. Okay, I have to do that and I have to do that. And sometimes you don't take the time to stop, reflect on what happened, and being like, "Whoa, I'm super proud of myself." For, uh, for example, you say you 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 I know you paint and you you do photography, right? Oh, I'm very very proud of that photo. You know, we don't really take that time, and I'm really excited about taking the time to reflect and to feel like very grateful about all the things I went through. Right. That's beautiful. That's a beautiful way to approach life in general. If you were to tell me one one thing off the top of your head that you're super proud of right now, what would it be? I'm super proud of still being aware of my inner child and listening to my inner child. I have a huge smile on my face right now, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I think that's going to... um to continue to feed your curiosity definitely like yeah. i really feel her i feel amina as a young girl as a three years old i don't know why but it's three years old that i really feel deep down inside of me she's always there and while i'm healing her she's healing me and i do talk i remember something when i was 11 years old i like i I wanted to be a musician and I always say to everyone, my first show would be in Montreux Jazz Festival. And everyone was like making fun of me. It was like, yeah, 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 and I'll be a, a Nobel Prize. And I started a band with my friends, we were a girl band, and we're like, okay. And I used to always tell them, my first show would be in Montreux Jazz Festival. And you know what? My first gig with Calabusson was in the Montreux Jazz Festival. I remember that when I came back to the Montreux Jazz Festival two years ago, I decided to imagine that Anna, who was three years old, was just with me walking on stage. And I talked to her and I was like, we are here. And I was so moved, you know, to imagine myself just next to me. And it was a kind of ritual. It was like we did it. And so that's why she's always there. Because everyone, even when other people were not supporting me, she was there and she's still there. And I do... Um, she, like, I don't know, I'm very proud of her. It's uh, beautiful because one that is actually a very common theme when I speak to actors, musicians, performers, is that they're often doing it for the little person inside oh. of them. <laughs> yeah, it does make a lot of sense, no? <laughs> yeah, absolutely, 100%. Uh, I have one last question before we go. Uh, if yeah. you were to write a book on any topic, what would it be? I'm writing a book, actually. You are? <laughs> well, there we go. <laughs> On karate. No, I'm kidding. But <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually, I'm, I'm writing a book. When I was younger, before wanting to be a singer, I wanted to be a writer. Actually, I always wanted to have a link with words. Because as a young person, I understood the power of words and that every word would float in the universe for the eternity. I understood that very precisely. So, I don't know, I always wanted to write a book, but I never felt that I was good enough. Or uh, So I decided to start that during the, the pandemic. I was like, why not now? And I'm writing a book about, um, about a lot of different things, actually, about biology, about psychology, about uh, child abuse, about a spiritual path. I don't really know what this book is about. And maybe people would tell me, it's about, like my songs, you know, I discover it through people and through their experiences. So maybe people would tell me about my own book <laughs> when I finish it. Well, I mean, I think you're going to get the some interesting feedback, but I think uh, it would be, it'll definitely, I look forward to reading it for sure. Uh, mm -hmm. And and are you sharing the process uh, publicly or are you just keeping it to yourself for now? For now, I'm keeping it to myself because it's a very personal book. But once I have finished it, I think I will start talking about it. But it's for me, it's like protecting a secret. You know what I mean? Like mm, yeah. not bringing bad luck. You know, my mother always told me about the um, the end of Fatima, you know, like all those things. Like she, she, she was very superstitious. So I kind of keep that. <laughs> I don't want to bring bad luck to this process. Okay, well, then we won't talk about it too, too much. But I um listen, I wanted to tell you, first of all, thank you 
Uh, speaking of gratitude, I'm very, very grateful that you decided to take uh, to say yes to this interview. It's been uh, very moving uh, to hear your thoughts on the various topics you talked about including learning a lot more about you, which is uh, very refreshing. And I feel more connected to you as an artist than I ever have. So I really am very grateful that you came on the show. Thank you so much for the invitation. You know, for me, it's actually speaking in English for that long, for that amount of time, it's an experience and it's very interesting. And I'm a bit intimidating because sometimes I feel like I'm a three years old trying to express my, <laughs> my thoughts <laughs> because writing and speaking is very different process but thank you so much because you know in a way i don't know how you we start connecting but i kind of feel like you are part of my life somehow you know what i mean like it's what mm. i have with with a lot of people actually following me like i kind of start seeing their name for example in the comments and they keep commenting and then i talk to them and then i feel them and i see them you know and with yeah. you, it's the same. We, we, I don't know how we connected, but then I see what you, what you're doing, and it's amazing. This, this, the show you have, and all the things you are starting, and the way you're blossoming. So thank you so much for having me, because it's a, it was a very nice experience. Thank you. It's been my pleasure, absolute pleasure. Thank you. <laughs>